You know, before we get started, there's uh, something I have to share with you beautiful people. If uh, if you're listening, you probably do like your cinema from all across the globe, and uh, I think I've got something that's going to be right up your alley. There's this new streaming service. It's called Film Movement Plus, and it opens up a world of award-winning entertainment, including some of the best films from around the globe, and that is the truth. Uh, among the hundreds of titles that there are waiting for your discovery, and there are hundreds of titles, it's really a rich and fantastic service. There's some of the best stuff from 2020 as well, stuff like uh, Wild Goose Lake, which we cannot recommend enough, and uh, things like Zombie Child, which uh, played festivals, and it's and there's so much more, and there's a lot of really great stuff. You can find uh, the app for it on your Roku, on your Apple TV, or on your Amazon Fire, not to mention on your laptop, desktop, as well as any sort of mobile devices. Uh, and Film Movement Plus is a measly five ninety nine a month. It is a great deal, but as a listener of our podcast, and uh, we got some, we got a treat for you. If you sign up today for Film Movement Plus, we're going to give you a 30-day free trial, plus the next three months at 50% off when you use the promo code SEATS. That is a fantastic, fantastic deal. If you love foreign cinema, I cannot recommend that enough. Sign up today at filmmovementplus.com or follow the link that we have provided uh, on the podcast or on the YouTube link below to uh, click through and get watching today. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, there are times when this job is just an unequivocal pleasure, and if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion, because that's kind of how we like to do it. And if you like how we do it, and I'm assuming you do, you're listening to us right now, we would love it if you'd subscribe to our podcast. Uh, you can find us over at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, basically wherever you get your, your podcasts. Also, you can find every single one of our episodes archived over at our YouTube channel. Also, we'd really, we'd really think it was great if you'd follow us on social media. If you can do that at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One. Uh, and finally, and I dare say most importantly, please give us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest uh, movie news, reviews, coverage from all over the world and all sorts of platforms, and even some TV, too, because that's just how we roll. We love talking about the moving image, and we love it when you read about it. So uh, please give us a check out on this episode. Well, this is a lovely a lovely human being who I've enjoyed talking to in the past. She is a friend of the site. She is a friend of cinema in general. We are talking with the enigmatic and the iconic Ingrid Veniger about her new film, uh, One Nine, One Bracket Nine, which is an anthology film, uh, which basically was made in COVID, and it takes uh, an entire team of filmmakers, including Ingrid herself, uh, Mina Shum, Issa Ben, uh, Slater, uh, Slater Jewel Kimmaker, as well as people from Germany, uh, Dorothy Winner, uh, Shang Si Zhu from China, Carmen Sangyon from South Africa, Lydia Zinnerman from Spain, and it is it is nine female 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 filmmakers. Sorry, coming together uh, and made a short film exploring what it means to find connection in a time of isolation. And they're all together in this anthology film, One Bracket Nine. And it's it's a lovely, lovely film that really does speak to how we've all been feeling, how we're all still feeling. It's, it, it's a real important piece of work, in my opinion. And it is having its world premiere at the uh, Canada's Female Eye Film Festival, which is beginning on March 26th online. Uh, and uh, we will include a link for you to go check it out afterwards if you like, if you want more information on the film festival. But we had a lovely talk with Ingrid uh, just in terms of what inspired her to make the film, why they got this ball rolling, uh, and just sort of how the art of film, not just filmmaking, but 
you know, even film watching and film discovery is is changing in some pretty exciting ways. And we had a fantastic talk, which I certainly hope you enjoy because I know I did. Well, I mean, obviously, just thank you so much for the time. As always, I appreciate it. You were a, you were a dear to do this, and congratulations on the film. I remember you post. I remember this feels like an eternity ago. You posted something on Facebook about this, and now it's turned into a film. Like, walk me through sort of the the origin steps of doing this project. Well, I was thinking about that last night. So, what day are we right now? March eighteenth. Is that yeah? Where we are. Yeah. So it was essentially, I think, exactly one year to the day that I made my first outreach to three women to see if they would be interested in working on a collaborative project. And Jennifer Pademski was the first to reply. And she just said, Yes, exclamation. And that's what kind of got the ball rolling. And that was, I think, a year ago to the day. And by March 30th, um, we had our, you know, our, our, our band of women um, kind of come together and say, let's make something. We had no idea what it was going to be at that time, but we wanted to make something that was going to reflect our own experiences of you know, the, the time of the pandemic, of isolation, of alienation, of being in different parts of the world um, through the through our, you know, our individual lenses. And I really wanted that sort of international kind of reflection. So within 10 days, the, the filmmakers committed. I think in April, we had our first Zoom together. And then we all split off and made our films and none of us knew what the other was really making. Um, we made that promise that we would just trust each other, that we would trust ourselves, that we would be courageous. And essentially the thing that locked down the process was a timeline. So we decided on a date that we would submit our rough cuts and then our fine cuts and then our picture locks. We worked with a supervising editor, Rick Bartram, um, who worked with us remotely through the entire process and then kind of um, sequenced the films. And then we went into sound design, we went into mix, we went into color grading all remotely, working with um, good folks at Deluxe. And here we are one year later with our world premiere. See, this is the thing that amazes me. And I mean, I I'm, I shouldn't be surprised because this, this, this whole project really feels sort of the ethos of of the punk films aesthetic that you've been pushing and preaching for so long, but I've got to imagine doing post and zoom is a different experience altogether. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, I mean, first of all, all of the filmmakers were in different places. Many of us were in different time zones. I had never, I'd, I had met Issa Ben and Slater through the Canadian Film Center, but Mina Shum and I had never worked together. I mean, we met a couple of times. Um, the filmmaker from Germany, I mean, we're, 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 our age ranges are 20 to 60. Um, we are, a, you know, a group of BIPOC women, um, European, Chinese, American, across Canada, South African, um, Spanish, and none of us really knew each other or had met prior to like the first time that we gathered on Zoom. Wow. So it was pretty punk in terms of, you know, saying yes to something in a, in a, in a very uncertain kind of overwhelming time that was in itself completely full of uncertainty and just kind of saying yes, because we then somehow became accountable and responsible to each other. And that created kind of an inspiration for us to create because none of us wanted to let the other down. And then we just, we just made this thing. I was so struck by the through line, especially with everyone's work. And I mean, I'm curious from your perspective, do, do you think something like this could have been made without this shared global experience that we're all going through? Because, I mean, I can imagine if it had been something else, it could have diverted into sort of various different forms. But be, because we're all going through the same thing, 
the trust almost felt it almost felt like it was pre-built in. Yeah. No, I don't think so. I think it came from needing a lifeline in a way. Mm. We we all needed each other and the film is greater than the sum of its parts and like many projects, you know, nine other w women would have made a completely different kind of um, one nine sort of collective experiment. It would have been completely different, but there was something about our, our group without even consciously knowing it, somehow we plugged into a flow or a vibe where you see these nine chapters, you see these nine sort of tracks on an album. We used to think, we, we thought of it as like tracks on an album when we were mm. sort of conceptualizing. And you see these threads and these echoes, these resonances that were that are completely, um, you know, s subconscious or subliminal. And I think that has come very directly out of the very specific time that we were experiencing through our isolation in completely different parts of the world. It's absolutely anchored in the being situated in the global pandemic. And I've got to figure that this shared creative endeavor also was a a push and a pull for all of you just to to not just do the work, but to sort of be invested in the work. Because I mean, and this is something that's true of all of us. I mean, there are days where we don't want to go outside. There are days where we don't want to get out of bed. And that's just part of the human condition. But seeing the film, it really feels like this was nine collective artists sort of bringing themselves up to, to make something. Yeah. And the, I mean, you know, I think we were, we were all overwhelmed and as we continue to be and kind of exhausted and it almost felt like an impossible ask this time last year. Mm. You know, it was just, we were flooded with just navigating how to, like you said, just, just wake up, just to function, just to, navigate you know hour by hour so at the same time as this was a lifeline it was kind of a, it was kind of uh you know a really really intense commitment a kind of terrifying commitment actually because we really did take it seriously and we you know we we didn't know if we would have anything at the end of the day we were just like the act of making something, the act of promising that we were going to do something together was kind of as far as we were like, we're doing that. That's already a lot. And then if if something comes of this, that's bonus. Do you know? Yeah. What we committed to was that we would we would we would make something um, during this time that was completely overwhelming and uncertain. And we would promise each other that we would deliver something by this date and we would throw our guts into it and we would work from a personal place and we would work from our 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 direct experience of this very specific time and was it going to work were these nine chapters going to make some kind of cohesive whole like some sort of exquisite corpse we had no idea so we put the process ahead of the result for sure and our our commitment was in the execution in embracing our limitations we could work with family members that we were isolating with um, many of us were in quarantine we had access to very limited equipment no film lights um, some were shot on phones some on ipads some of us had like i had a small sony handy cam i know jennifer Podemsky had a c300 it was just whatever we had access to became our tools and we just said okay we're gonna we're gonna completely embrace those limitations and innovate i love that because i mean and this is something i'm seeing more and more as we live with it we live with the way the world is and how it will be because in our business like be it from the filmmaking side or from my side how we go about our day-to-day -day business has changed mm -hmm. and it's in like not for not for the worst or not for the better but it has changed and seeing how we all adapt to that has really made me think about 
not just sort of the the importance of embracing the creative process, but the importance of, I guess, understanding just sort of the ebb and flow of this business in general, because at least for me, like at least from my perspective, it, it feels like film has almost, and these experiences that we used to have by going to the theater, going to festivals, they've all been democratized now, mm -hmm. but it's allowing the creativity to sort of push up to a, a different level because it's all at the same plateau. There isn't, there isn't a tier, you know, sort of situation. It's not a question of you're playing a couple of festivals, then the film's going to go away. It's like, no, your film will have the exact same value as a Marvel movie or something else in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really created sort of this interesting dynamic on how movies get made, I think. Yes. Well, certainly like, T you know, access to technology democratized. And now, as you're saying, it's access to platforms of exhibition, of connection to people globally has been democratized because we're, we're all online and I'm seeing fantastic things happening. You know, like when Questlove decides to spin at 11 o'clock at night, it's a <laughs> I'm like, yes, this is there. There are some things that have happened in this pandemic that I just simply would not have access to before. Um, so that that's kind of inspiring. And I think we were thinking about that. I mean, the freedom to create is something we need to give ourselves permission for um, consistently, you know, sort of relentlessly. We have to give ourselves permission because we still feel there are gatekeepers, even if they're just imagined ones. Right. And a big obstacle oftentimes is financing. Yeah. So the fact that we could make this film collectively and join from all over the world and, you know, have Deluxe step up and say, yes, we'll help you post this remotely so it sounds good and it's graded by expert colorists and sound designers and everything, even though we may have shot on our iPhones and our iPads, that's that's some personal capital there, you know, that people did still step up and, and give us some en enormous breaks, but we could be um, so creatively independent because this didn't really cost a lot of money. And I, I did receive a small grant from um, York University. Uh, so I was able to pay all the filmmakers, a, you know, a small honorarium, but Ultimately, when we when we, we launched into committing to this project, there was no discussion of are we going to get paid? How much are we going to get paid? Um, what happens if we sell this? How are we going to divide the revenues? Like we, we have spoken about that, but it certainly wasn't the impetus. So the impetus was to create and to collectively um, embark on this experiment. And we had no one asking us what we were going to make, how these films were going to be linked, um, whether an audience was going to get it, who the audience was, where it was going to be shown, um, who was going to just, we didn't have any of those questions coming at us. So we could simply trust our instincts, make whatever we felt like making within, you know, we all said we'd make something around 10 minutes. So we knew nine of us would mean like approximately a 90 minute film. We wanted to make a feature, but we were just, and then, and then we were like curious about what the other was making because of course we had no idea until we delivered our rough cuts. So it was curiosity that was driving us and it was an accountability to one another that was driving us. And that was it. There was no one overseeing our process. And that is, I think that's the exceptional thing that we don't, we don't always get to experience. And that is something that I value so much when People are just willing to say yes um, without any real understanding or um, guarantee of a result. That that thrills me and continues to thrill me, and that's what happened in this project. Well, and I mean, and I mean, you're right because that is that is a courage that I guess sort of the the current global situation has allowed from sort of our standpoint. But I'm also kind of curious because. As much as you are a filmmaker, you are someone who is involved in teaching the next generation of filmmakers. But how do you sort of balance the learning with the teaching? Because especially these days, 
we're all learning as we go, but there's also people below us or people coming up who will be looking for guidance. And especially during this time, it almost feels like we don't know which way to go. So I, I almost feel bad when someone asks me for advice at, at this, like during these times, because I'm not entirely sure where the business is going. Yeah. And then, you know, we look at the, I mean, I look at someone like uh, Chloe Zhao who did Nomadland and yeah. did, we have thought that she would get a best director nominee for the Academy Awards. I mean, Nomadland, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that's a film I watched and I went, I wish I made that film. And yet that's a film that is so, it has Frances McDormand. Of course, she's a, a courageous performer, but it's a film that's trusting itself, that's trusting the process that, you know, echoes some of my experiences with Mettler, which is a kind of intuition in action, you know? And Frances, when she talks about playing that role, it was like they, you know, there was there was grounding in that character. And then in terms of engaging with a lot of real people that had never acted before, it was about being present and being in the moment and be, and reacting truthfully and honestly in any given situation. It's like, that's the way, that's, I mean, that's the kind of filmmaking I love. And I'm encouraged by a nomination like that because, you know, that next to Promising Young Woman, it's like there's room for all of it. So I think this time has exploded possibility. It's hopefully encouraged different kinds of innovation. And we are giving ourselves permission to just drop the sh bullshit and and um, do what really matters in ways that really matter to us as artists, as storytellers, as creators, as students, as established filmmakers, as emerging, you know, makers, all of it. Because our world can change in a second. Yeah. So let's not waste any time with the bullshit. I'm so glad you brought up Emerald and Promising Young Woman because that really does feel like a film that in other years may have been dismissed as sort of a genre movie and just been sort of put on that pile. But to see the love that it's been getting really does speak to the time of just, like you say, washing away the bullshit and letting sort of the quality of the work stand above all else, which really is the thing we've all been striving for from day one, hasn't it? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And maybe our tolerances are just, you know, we're a little bit more impatient. We're a little bit um, more demanding of substance for our time um, because time is so, you know, we know how precious it is and we know when we have loved ones and friends and people in our community that are, are, really struggling. This pandemic has knocked a lot of people out. So if we're going to be putting our energy into making things, let's, we got to make sure it matters and that it's contributing something and that it's, um, that it's compelling and that it's something we care about sharing. Otherwise, you know, I, I, I think that the era of indulgence is done. No, you're absolutely right. And it's, that kind of spins into something else I wanted to ask because I'm kind of curious because, I mean, you became a filmmaker because you wanted to make films, you wanted to tell stories, but at the same time, we're living in a world where there's a possibility your films may never be seen in a theater again. And I'm kind of curious, does that change your creative drive or does it sort of open it up a bit more? I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I still think big screen and you know some of my films have played big screen and then you know um end up on small screen and I I've seen them on Vimeo VOD and I've seen them on iTunes and I've seen them on television and you know it's like it's not 5-1 it's stereo or people are listening into mono and the color grading's weird and the ratio gets messed up and you know I'm shooting Porcupine Lake in these long single wide shots and that just doesn't really translate as well on the small screen because I was thinking big screen. So I think that there is, an, there is, a, there is a different kind of in, intention if I start thinking about making something that 
won't see a, a big screen ever, like perhaps beyond its premiere at a film festival. I think it will impact my potentially some of my pacing choices, some of my framing choices, um, for sure. Yeah, and I, I'm starting to think about that more and more. I think if I'd, you know, if I thought about Porcupine Lake not being on the big screen, it would have more close-ups. It would have more edits. It would have a different kind of pacing and rhythm, for sure. But then wouldn't you second-guess yourself? Because, I mean... I mean, I love that you bring up Porcupine Lake because it's on Prime and it's like, would you have had the same audience on a platform like Prime if you had made more of those conscious changes, knowing that maybe more people would be seeing it on the small screen as opposed to the big screen? You know, it's so interesting. It's like, um, I think it still has to, the, the move has to be authentic to the story. But I do think that when we are, you know, when we are in that, cinema space there is a different you know i watch films on amazon prime in a very different way than i watch films at the light box like there is there's sure. no yeah. question there's no question um i'm giving that work a slightly different attention slightly different focus i am expecting sl sl something different from the film um both image wise and and sound sound audio scape wise so i feel like it's not to become more conventional or more safe or more, um, you know, uh, more reductive, but it's just to like, cr I think it's a beautiful challenge to within, to, to like innovate and sculpt and craft for a smaller screen. I, I kind of like that. I've never thought about, you know, what the impact of that will be. But I would like to think about my next film is something that will be playing on people's laptops or on people's phones and conceive of the film from the get-go um, with that in mind, which I've never, ever done before. And not again to like conventionalize it in any way, but how do I innovate differently? How do I make bold choices that are connected to the story um, on that smaller screen? I want to think about that. And and I love that you say that because, I mean, especially going forward, be it for theatrical ex exhibition or what have you, it feels like in the aftermath of all this, the art of curation, be it from the filmmaker side or be it from the programmer side on whatever platform, be it theatrical or whatnot, is going to become more and more important. Yeah, I think so. I think it's all it really super interconnected. And I, you know, I feel like it's it was great to have 10 years of thinking big and um, feeling like my openings could be super, super slow and nothing really happens at the five or 10 minute mark. It happens at like the 20 or 30 minute mark. Right. You know, not that audiences are kind of like trapped inside the cinema, but they're just more willing to hang out with it. Whereas, you know, now I'm starting to think a little bit more consciously about my openings. Like, again, not to make them um, snappier in any sort of kind of conventional way, but I am thinking about, okay, what is the impact I want to have in the first three minutes if all I have is the first three minutes of someone's attention before they close their computer? And it's I, smart yeah. to be aware of that as an artist as well, isn't it? Because that's that's just showing the ability to adapt and to sort of understand the times that we're living in. Not necessarily compromising the art, but knowing how to adapt the art to the audience, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's like tailor fitting, you know, a, a, a beautiful suit or something like that. I, I feel like... It's just a different way. It's a different kind of box. It's a different kind of frame to sort of play in. But I still love, like, you know, I can appreciate a WandaVision. I can really appreciate a WandaVision. For sure. But I love, you know, I watched this Ethiopian film called Lamb. Or I love Vinterberg's Last Round. Or I just, oh, yeah. I, I love... You know, I was I watched Maisel brother, the Maisel brothers um, recently again, and I love you know meandering sort of verite style films with no clear protagonist that wants any kind of like 
direct thing with an obstacle that they have to overcome. Like, I love those meandery stories. Like, I liked Malcolm and Marie, you know, that was yeah. on Netflix that was shot in the pandemic following, you know, kind of heavy COVID protocols and, and planning. That was a two-hander shot in black and white, Barry Levinson in one location, stunning location, and essentially almost like a like a play, like it could have been a play. I love that. Um, so I feel like I just, it's like a time for everybody to do whatever they want. Just do whatever you want. Make it big screen. It'll show on the small screen. Make it small screen. It might show on the big screen. Do big sound. Do small intimate character stuff. Do crazy sci-fi stuff. If you know that's your jam. I feel like it's just a time to be honest with who you are and what you want and then throw all your guts into that and don't waste any time. And I think that's that's a beautiful message to to put out there. And I mean, I think one nine really kind of does that a bit because there is there is such, like I say, a beautiful through line with sort of the shared collectiveness of it all. And especially as filmmakers and film critics and film fans, there is there is such a time that like we're in such a universe where Varda can play next to a Godzilla movie. It's yeah. it, like it all works together. It's like why the hell not? It's let's experience it all and take what we can get from it. Yeah, I love that. I see a Varda Godzilla double bill. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I also, I guess, what you just sort of re reminded me of in terms of these platforms and audiences and how people participate in an experience in different works is. You know, there was a minute where I thought one nine as a single platform, you know, 85 minute piece um, with these with these nine sort of chapters or tracks where an audience is just kind of got to go, just got to flow. Like there's not a there's not a hand sort of guiding you through the film, you know, these are nine works that were made during the pandemic with filmmakers that were isolating in different parts of the world. And it's this kind of collective experiment, but then you're just kind of in this space and you experience this ride. And we did think, okay, if this is, if we're in a, in an online space now indefinitely, who knows, certainly for this year we were, we also made a, we ventured to make a web based, a, web-based version of the film mm -hmm. whereby you know you go to a site and um the head credits come and then these sort of nine dots explode to be these sorts of nine pulsing orbs and viewers could experience these pieces in whichever way they want so they could they could watch it from you know mina shum's touch all the way around or they could start on my film and watch it all backwards or zigzag across the pieces or basically it we be, we turn it into a kind of one nine choose your own adventure version <laughs> i love it <laughs> so that's something i'm also playing with like because i've always part of me has always wanted to do one of those steven soderbergh you know and you know i experimented a bit with he hated pigeons and the live right. scoring but part of me loves the sort of changeability um and interactivity of audiences interacting with the work and how they might impact affect it like in this web-based version you know it would be great if maybe more people contributed to it so we have these nine orbs but maybe someone else wants to make you know a film while they're in isolation and then you know we just expand these orbs we have a hundred orbs and people can choose their own adventure amongst more um, you know, women filmmakers telling stories at this particular time and in, in, in their own particular places. So I love ex the expansiveness, the expansive potential of storytelling right now on the web. And I love the potential for interactivity and immersion. So I'm, 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 I'm thinking about that more and more too. Like I'd love to throw up footage to one of my films and have someone completely re-edit it and that kind of thing. Um, much like, you know, different musicians live scored He Hated Pigeons. So that in that way, the work kind of stays alive, you know, because when we make films, they kind of become this fixed thing in time. And I, I do love exploring with how the work can stay alive as people kind of continue to interact with it and let it 
let it change and evolve and shift in ways that I, I don't control. I kind of instigate the work. Yeah. And then I just let it go. And I, for me, that's kind of the terrifying. It was the scary part of making this, this initiating one nine is it kind of wind this thing up. And I invite these women that I've never worked with before to sort of join and they say yes. And then it's kind of set on this track. And then I just have to let it go. Like, and just completely accept whatever it is. So it's all kind of an exercise in accepting what is and not trying to control it so much, which I think is a really, which has been the exercise of this time that yeah. we're because we and, can't control anything. No, you're absolutely right. And I mean, I, and I love that you say that because I, I mean, I really think not just this film, but in general, it's, it's a reminder that just because we're working on a small screen or watching on a small screen doesn't mean that epic things can't be made. And I think this, film definitely kind of qualifies into that category and i just want to say thank you again ingrid as always you were an absolute pleasure to talk to and i miss you terribly i miss people terribly <laughs> yeah. thank you so much i really enjoy talking with you too and congratulations again on the premiere and again thank you for making the film it's out there in the universe and that's going to be a beautiful thing yeah and you're the first person i've spoken to about it so yes. that's really mm. good. yeah <laughs> all right well thanks again for the time ingrid all right Bye. Right. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.